we actually gathered quite a lot of very interesting information about the early Limerick Spirons, the London Spirons, and the Cambridge Spirinx. And in the next few slides, I'll present a summary of what we have gathered so far. But all of this information is available on the website, so do check out the Spear and Surname Project website for uh, these three specific families. Now, the early Limerick Spearns uh, are... We know a lot about them because of the wills and other documents that uh, we have found over the years, and these allow the reconstruction of the family. We have the will of Matthew Spearin from 1719, and we also have the will of Luke Spearin from 1726. Now, there are several uh, versions of these wills. Um, we have uh, versions that were written by Sir William Beetham, who was the chief herald in Ireland back in the early 1800s, and these particular extracts here were found in the Green Manuscripts in the National Archives of Ireland. Uh, based on these wills, we've put together a, a five-generation pedigree for the early Limerick Spirons, and uh, the fact that they married into the Hartwell family, as we've already seen, is very, very significant. And these Hartwells were mayors of Limerick in the latter half of the 1600s, around about 1667, I believe, and 1676. And they were granted land in Ireland um, in very specific areas, specifically uh, Boher Quill or Boher Nakaili, which became the burial ground of the Spirans. And in actual fact, you can see uh, up here at the top of uh, Luke's will that he is to be buried at Boher Nakaili. Uh, and in one of Beetham's ac extracts of the wills, it's described as the burial ground of my family. Uh, so why the Spirans were being buried in land that had been originally been granted to Captain Humphrey Hartwell is um, uh, very interesting. Uh, it suggests a very close relationship between the two families. Now, the Hartwells actually were fighting uh, for Charles I. Uh, he was... Um, uh, they, so they were royalists rather than Cromwellians, and that has allayed the fears of quite a few people in the family. Um, so, based on these early documents, we've been able to put together these five generations. There were three brothers, Matthew, Nicholas, and Luke, who were supposed to be uh, the sons of George Spearing from London, but we don't have definite confirmation of that from any other sources other than William Beetham's notes. We do have two lines that can be traced down from these early Limerick Spearings to the present day. And the first one is that of uh, the Hartwell family. So Barry Hartwell married Mary Spearin, the daughter of Matthew Spearin, and they had Broderick, Francis, Houlton, Broderick, Edward, Broderick, Broderick, uh, Sir Anthony, and Timothy. And Sir Anthony is currently the sixth baronet of Dale Hall in Essex, and he lives in Barton-on-Sea in uh, the UK. And you can find all of this information uh, available online, uh, publicly available in thepeerage.com. Thepeerage.com. Um, it's basically Burke's Peerage Online. So uh, that's the first of the lines. The second of the lines is uh, follows the daughter of Luke. Um, Luke had a daughter called Alice who married an Edward Morgan and they trace themselves down to the present-day Parker family in Limerick. So we do have documentary evidence that uh, two particular lines of the family can trace their uh, ancestry all the way back to uh, either Matthew or Luke, these early Limerick Spearans. However, for the majority of us, we still have these three to four missing generations. And why DNA can't help in this particular situation? Because of the female roadblock. Uh, you see that Matthew would not have passed his Y-DNA down to Mary. The Y-DNA in this line is all Hartwell Y-DNA, and so is of no direct relevance to the Spirans. Uh, similarly, in, in this line here, uh, Luke would not have passed Y-DNA onto Alice uh, she would have married uh, Captain Edward Morgan, who would have passed on Morgan Y-DNA to their son. But then there's further female roadblocks, and then thereafter there is Parker Y-DNA down to the present day. 
So Y-DNA help does not help us in, the, in this situation. Um, and we have these three to four missing generations that we need to elucidate, and that's why we are collecting orphan records. Uh, these are coming online all the time. They usually date from um, the early 1800s, uh, going back into the 1700s. And Job has, uh, Bob has done a wonderful job of putting these into the orphan record spreadsheet on the website. And currently there is approximately 426 orphan records there. And hopefully in time we'll be able to allocate these records to specific individual families. But of course, all of this information is very, very useful, but does not address uh, one of the key questions, which is, how did the early Limerick Spearans get to Limerick, and why? Now, we turn now to Sir William Beetham. Uh, he was uh, an antiquarian and a genealogist. He lived from 1779 to 1853, but most importantly, he became the Ulster King of Arms uh, between 1820 and 1853. And like many genealogists, he spent 20 years working 8 to 10 hours per day making notes and sketch pedigrees from all of the wills in Ireland. All of the wills that went up in smoke in 1922 when the public record office went on fire. Uh, so we don't have any of those wills, but we do have 40 volumes of Sir William Beetham's notes relating to these wills and the sketch pedigrees that he constructed as a result of them. And this has become an invaluable resource for Irish researchers, something that Sir William Beetham never would have imagined. Now, there are no Spearin sketch pedigrees in the genealogical office, not that I could find anyway when I visited there a couple of years ago. Um, and the other rather worrying thing is that some people have said about Sir William Beetham's uh, notes that his phil philological deductions were not generally deemed satisfactory, and some people have used the word speculative. So it does raise questions about were Beetham's notes correct? And this is the note written by Sir William Beetham in relation to the Spearin family. And what I've done is I've tried to interpret it in this upper section here. And it says uh, Spearin, Visitation of London, 1633. And that is correct because the Spearins did appear in the Visitation of London in 1633. And this is available on the website. You can see that George Spearing married uh, uh, Elizabeth Hanbury. They had several children, including George Spearin, who married Rebecca Carter. And that is the, the key uh, marriage that we'll be talking about here. It also says, uh, I can't really make out what this bit at the end says, so if anybody has any ideas, I'd be very, very uh, welcome uh, to, I'd be very, very happy to hear them. Um, but it looks like there is some connection there with Essex as well. I haven't been able to figure that one out. And it talks about the administration um, of Rebecca's goods. Rebecca, daughter of Bartholomew Carter, which is correct from what we saw in the visitation. Um, she was an intestate widow. Well, the fact that she was a widow is correct because we know from our previous uh, work that uh, George Spearing died in 1657 and we have his will. Uh, he would have left Rebecca widowed at that point in time with at least these four children here. Um, uh, so that is what we that is we do have documentary information to support that. The uh, administration was granted to John Miller Esquire, but who he was, we have no idea. And it was for the use of Elizabeth Bainham, daughter and next heir. Well, it's true that uh, they did have a daughter called Elizabeth, and it's true that she did marry an Isaac Bainham, uh, rather late, actually, at the age of 45, in 1679. And the marriage didn't last very long because he died the following year. Uh, Elizabeth, however, herself lived to a grand old age and died in 1712. And we do have her will as well, but there's no mention in the will of anything to do with Ireland. Now, there's also a final note at the bottom of this uh, scrap of information, which says that Luke Spearin of Kappa and his brother Matthew were George's sons. So, there are still some unanswered questions. 
Why was Elizabeth Bainham in London getting married in 1679 when her 70-year-old mother was in Ireland and died the following year in 1680? Also, why were Luke, Matthew and Nicholas, the early Limerick Spearin brothers, not in the will of Rebecca? Is it because she was intestate and therefore all of her goods were granted to the next of kin, uh, being the eldest child rather than the eldest son? I find that a little unusual, but maybe that was the legal situation of the day. And also, where's the land? Uh, there's no mention of land in the... Um, administration of Rebecca Carter's will. So uh, so where was the land? Had it already been distributed to the children and they owned the land in their own right? And uh, why was there no mention of Limerick or the land or any of Elizabeth Spearing's uh, nephews and nieces, the children of Matthew, Nicholas and Luke, why was there no mention of them in Elizabeth Bainham's will? So there's still some interesting questions there that remain to be answered. Also, as far as Luke and uh, Matthew go, how does Sir William Beetham know that they were George's sons? Where were they born? Were they born in Ireland? Were they born in England? And we still have this question, how did they get to Ireland and why did they go to Ireland in the first place? So still a lot of unanswered questions questions and one is left with the feeling that Sir William Beetham knows something that we don't and it would be great if that original will of Rebecca and also the wills of Luke and Matthew were still existing but unfortunately the fire of 1922 has put paid to that. Turning to the London Spearings we have a lot of information about this family again it's all on the website and a George, who married Rebecca Carter, had three other brothers, a Nicholas, a Henry, and a William. Now, Nicholas was a goldsmith in his own right and became one in 1604. He was involved in the plantation of Ulster in 1609, helping the goldsmiths to organise their contribution to uh, King Charles the... It would have been King James I's uh, endeavours in Ulster. And they built the town called New Buildings, which is just south of Derry. Um, also Nicholas was an enchant of the artillery company, uh, later the Honourable Artillery Company, and uh, an enchant is an ensign bearer so he would have borne the flag and he was also captain of the regiment uh, associated with Lime Street and that was information we received from the artillery company relatively recently. Uh, Henry, his brother, would have died around about 1605. He did not survive childhood. William would have died relatively young in his late 20s, early 30s. George, on the other hand, went on to marry Rebecca Carter. And as we saw previously, we have a lot of information about George and uh, Rebecca's children, Elizabeth, Rebecca, Mary and George Jr. Um, according to Sir William Beetham, he also had sons Luke and Matthew, but uh, there is no documentary evidence of their birth. So, the London Spearings, we, the, 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 George the Elder was the father of these four brothers, and he had a brother called Nicholas, and both of them were goldsmiths. Nicholas uh, became a goldsmith in 1564. He was apprenticed to William Fox, so um, it's interesting that uh, someone who possibly came from Flanders was apprenticed to an English uh, goldsmith. Now Nicholas then took on George as a, an apprentice in 1568. So George would have been around about 10 years old or so, uh, giving a rough date of birth of about 1558. So Nicholas would have been considerably older than his younger brother George. Um, George became a goldsmith in 1577. Nicholas was also a merchant and imported a lot of goods from Antwerp. And we find this information in the London port books. And it's interesting to see the sort of things that he was importing. They included looking glasses, lutes and petticoats. Uh, so he was a general merchant as well as a goldsmith. George also had connections with Flanders. He became a free man of the merchant adventurers in Flanders uh, in 1574. 
and he would have been around about 16 years old when this happened. Uh, so he became a, a free man of this particular guild uh, while he was still a teenager, and in actual fact before he became a uh, free man uh, of the Goldsmiths Society, the Goldsmiths Guild. He was also John Stowe's deputy. Uh, he was a governor of Bridewell Hospital. Nicholas had three wives and three children, of whom William and Harry possibly survived, because we have no evidence that they died in childhood. Uh, George, on the other hand, uh, had one wife, Rebecca Carter. Um, not, not Rebecca Carter, William Han uh, Elizabeth Hanbury. And they had uh, 13 children. And we know from wills and deeds and leases and church records that they were all baptised in St Andrew's Undershaft and lived on Leadenhall Street. Now the thing to note here is the four names Nicholas, William and George. These are uh, four names that we actually see both in the, the, the early Limerick Spiran family tree but also in many of the family trees of Spirans uh, existing to this day. The other point to note is of course this uh, connection with Flanders. Uh, George becomes a free man of the merchant adventurers in Flanders and Nicholas, his brother, imported a lot of goods from Antwerp. So there was a toing and froing between London and Flanders. Now they lived on Leadenhall Street and here's an early map of Leadenhall Street. If you see here, this is St Andrew's Undershaft Church, this is St Mary's Axe going up here and this is Lime Street coming down this way here. Just in front of St Andrew's Undershaft there is a maypole and this maypole was taller than the church itself. It was also called a shaft. So that's why St. Andrew's was under the shaft, because the shaft actually reached taller than the church itself. And people would dance around the Maypole every May Day. Here you can see them celebrating, uh, people on the balconies looking on. And they have these ribbons that would turn around the Maypole and give it that kind of spiral effect. So this was very much a pagan festival. Now, we have so much information about the London Spirans, it's, it's really quite amazing, because they rented their properties on Leadenhall Street from the Rochester Bridge Trust. And we have uh, the front elevations of the buildings. They, this is Shaft Alley here. They would have lived on either side of it. Uh, we even have floor plans of the place where they lived. Uh, here you see Shaft Alley, also called Sharps Alley, and underneath the tenements here the maypole would have been hung on these big uh, hooks uh, just under the eaves of the building and it would be left there for the entire year when it wasn't being used and of course guess who owned these tenements in Shaft Sally? The Spearings did. George and Nicholas Spearing. Uh, they owned quite a lot of property in and around and they also lived at 134, 135 and 137 uh, Leadenhall Street, which would be roughly about 137, 135, 134, and Shafts Alley was between these. So this is where the Spirans would have lived. Uh, quite uh, luxurious accommodation for those days. Now, today, here's St Andrew's Undershaft. Uh, you can see that the maypole, which would have been here, has been replaced by this gargantuan gherkin, which is one of the most iconic architectural structures in London today. And if you look at Leadenhall Street on Google Earth, you can see St Andrew's here in the background. You can just make out the gherkin behind this crane. Um, here is number 140 Leadenhall Street, so 137 would be about here, 135, 134. Shafts Alley would be roughly in the same position as this little alleyway here. And if you go around the corner today, this is what you'll see. They still have the maypole up against the wall. A little bit of our heritage survives from the late 1500s. Of course, uh, in due course, uh, there were some rather puritanical religious people uh, that fired up the crowd and the, the uh, maypole was destroyed and cut up into little pieces for firewood at some stage in the uh, 1500s or 1600s. So uh, the Spirans may not have uh, had it under the eaves of their cottages for too long. So how did the London Spearings get to Limerick, and why? 
This remains one of the most tantalising questions regarding our link to London. Was it because of the plague of 1665 which killed 20% of the population of London? Or was it the Great Fire of London the following year in 1666 which apparently only killed 11 people? Uh, this is the extent of the fire and if we zoom in on this we can see that here is uh, the Tower of London over in the east. Here is St. Paul's Cathedral. And if you look just up here, there is St. Andrew's Undershaft. There is St. Mary's Axe. There is Lime Street. And you can see that the fire stopped halfway up Lime Street, right on the doorstep of where the Spirans lived in Leadenhall Street. So they were very, very lucky that they weren't burnt out by the fire of 1666. But it must have been uh, a long struggle to rebuild the city of London after that devastating fire. Another possibility, of course, is that being goldsmiths, they would have made uh, gold plates, gold cups for King Charles I, uh, who had no money and who was in debt. And so rather than repaying his debtors with money, he frequently gave them land grants. So it may very well be that uh, the Spirans were granted land in order to pay off some of Charles I's debts. But, having said that, I have found no information to suggest that they were granted land. And then, of course, there is the more um, family-related tragedy, which would have been the death of George Spearing um, in 1657, the husband of Rebecca Carter, and the supposed father of Luke and Matthew, did his uh, death throw the family on um, different circumstances and eventually force them to move to Limerick? So these are possibilities. There's lots of other theories as well, but as of yet, we still don't know how the London Spearings got to Limerick. We turn now to the link to Cambridge, and... In Cambridge, there was a, a chap called Nicholas Spierink, and he was born in 1470 in Zweindrecht, near Antwerp, which is just uh, north of Antwerp. And this, he came from a very large family who had established uh, family members in Lille, in Bruges, in Odenard, in Antwerp, and in Lyon, all members of the book trade, either as stationers or bookbinders or illuminators. And, um, of course, they needed gold to illuminate uh, manuscripts, and that could be a link to the London goldsmiths. Now, Nicholas uh, started off life in Antwerp, but he moved to Lille and then on to Cambridge in about 1500, and there's a lot of information about Nicholas. He imported books via London, according to the London Port books, and he was a prolific book binder. Uh, he bound about 300 books altogether, uh, including many volumes by Erasmus, with whom he was really quite friendly, and they exchanged letters. Now, he was also quite a religious person, because he was the church warden of Great St. Mary's, he was a beer brewer, and in 1534, King Henry VIII granted him and his two fellow printers a license to print books, and thus they became the first three printers of the Cambridge University Press. Uh, that still exists to this day. Now we have leases uh, and wills uh, relating to this particular family um, which establish his presence in Cambridge between 1505 and 1537 and then he passed away in 1546 uh, mentioning his son William in his will. Uh, William also was a stationer in his own right, uh, also a church warden and he married Elizabeth Cheek who was the sister of Sir John Cheek, uh, the tutor of King Edward VI, and also possibly Queen Elizabeth I. So uh, this is our connection to royalty. We actually taught them how to read and write. Um, and then William had a son called Nicholas, to whom his grandfather, the first Nicholas, left the cross keys in, in his will of 1546. And um, this uh, grandson, Nicholas, was still in Cambridge in 1563, which doesn't really tally with the um, dates we have for the London Spearings. So it may very well be that this particular Spearing was a cousin 
rather than a direct relation of the London Spearings. Points to note here are the four names Nicholas, William and Nicholas. These are four names that persist uh, to this day within the Spearin family. And also the fact that there is a link between Cambridge and London. Uh, Nicholas Spearing from Cambridge would frequently travel down to London to collect his books. The fact that the book trade is possibly associated with the illumination and with gold is another possible connection as well. And of course, our Nicholas Spearing was born near Antwerp. Now, some years ago, Bob put me a, a, a t in touch with this uh, famous quote, uh, a very large family with a disconcertingly limited choice of Christian names. And this particular statement was made by Professor David McKittrick in relation to the Spearin family um, in his book on Cambridge and the early uh, printers of Cambridge. So I contacted Professor McKittrick some time ago and he gave me the references uh, to some standard texts from which he had made this conclusion. And I recently visited the British Library, found these texts, and here is uh, what I found. Uh, the disconcertingly limited choice of Christian names relates to the forename Nicholas. There was a Nicholas Spearing in Lille in 1480. Then we have our uh, two Nicholases in Cambridge in 1505-1520. Then we have two Antonys in Antwerp. Uh, we have quite a few Nicholases from Dordrecht, which is right beside Zweindrecht, which is where uh, Nicholas Spearing from Cambridge was born. And then there's various other Nicholas Spearings in Amsterdam, in Hamburg, going all the way up to the 1740s. And these Spearings would have been involved in the book trade in one form or another. There's even a Nicholas Spearing that I discovered recently, born, or married rather, in St. Dunstan uh, and All Saints in Stepney, which is where the London Spearings had quite a lot of property. So if he was married in 1657, he could have been born around about 1639. Um, this could make him a brother of um, the, or a son of George Spearing and Rebecca Carter difficult to know. He could also be a cousin of some sort. So it would be interesting to follow this up. And uh, it's just an example of how new records are becoming available online all the time. And hopefully something will come up in the near future that will answer a lot of our questions. And with genealogy, you only need to be lucky once. However, the big question still remains, how did the London Spearings get to London? Um, did they come from Flanders? What was the, what was the reason for coming there? Um, and here is a map that just really shows uh, Flanders, England and Ireland all on the same page. Flanders is really the northern part of Belgium. Uh, the little stars indicate uh, where Spirans have been located via documentary evidence that we've just presented over the preceding um, couple of minutes and uh, there's Flanders there close up of what is actually uh, what towns are actually there you can see there's Bruges there's Ghent there's uh, Brussels there's Leuven uh, and there's Antwerp as well and Dordrecht and Sveindrecht are just uh, north of Antwerp and the theory is that the Spearans came over in about 1450 to England uh, some settling in Cambridge, maybe coming down to London, where they stayed for a hundred years, and then headed over to Ireland, where we have the 1680 will of Rebecca Carter, and the 1720 wills of Luke and Matthew, and they stayed in Limerick for about a hundred years, before um, uh, quite a large exodus of Spearans out of Ireland, um, to Canada, to the US, and to Australia in the 1820s, 30s, and 40s. Um, and of course, uh, a lot of Irish people emigrated from Ireland during this time. And it may have been because of the economic um, hardships faced uh, in Ireland. There were lots of mini famines prior to the big famine of 1845 uh, to 1848. So this financial and economic situation in Ireland would have caused a lot of people 
to seek better fortunes elsewhere, and the Spirans may have uh, emigrated for this reason also. So the next part of the story is the link to Flanders, and in the next video I'll be looking at uh, the evidence that links uh, the London Spearings and the Cambridge Spearings to Flanders, and relating that to, to the Spearans alive today, uh, to see what evidence there is that the origin of our surname was originally Flanders rather than England. So that will be the topic, topic of the next video presentation.